Welcome back to Taliesin's Map. Since it's Samhain, or Halloween, I thought I should tell you about one of the central Samhain myths of the Celts. There are actually many myths that are said in the old texts to take place on or around Samhain. The Second Battle of Moitura is said to conclude on Samhain. The taking of the Shi by Angus is said to be at Samhain, and even more events still if you search the lore. But the tale I'd like to highlight today is that of Fionn Macul and his battle with the burner, Alan Macmijna. As usual, my claim is that this myth has a parallel in another Indo-European branch, and knowing this parallel illuminates various hidden meanings that are still implicit within the Celtic version. It gives us a fuller understanding and appreciation of the Celtic version. And if I'm correct, then this parallel is also a great example of incremental divergence within the Celtic tradition itself, as we seem to have two versions of this Gaelic myth, one that is much closer to the Indian version, and one that shows some considerable differences, while still retaining the core elements. My argument is never that the myths don't change here and there, it's that we are able to trace core elements and myth patterns that show us which stories go back to a shared root myth. In this case, the Indian parallel is also a famous one, the churning of the ocean of milk, or the Samudra Manthana. I used to think it was possible that Alan would parallel the Norse Surt, but as seen in my Purusha myth stream, Surt has a much, much more exact parallel with Delvith, aka Lugith. And Delvith, aka Surt, is really the fiery Purusha, while Alan's myth ultimately parallels that of the one who emits the poison during the churning of the milk sea. This parallel is based on a clear understanding of Fion as the direct equivalent of Rudrashiva. If this is not conclusively grasped first, this parallel will not make sense. So please watch my videos, The One-Eyed Celtic Odin and Fion is Rudra, first before watching this, or read my book chapter on the same. But having established this equivalency, we are able to see the more hidden Rudra-type myths in the Fion tales, even when they require a bit more vision to do so, even when they are less blatant and more coded or even changed in outward appearance. But if Fion is Rudra, then this Fion tale of his encounter with Alan, which has the same core elements as the Rudra Shiva myth in question, the churning of the milk sea, this must be considered as a probable parallel. This in turn reinforces the close equivalence between Fion and Rudra Shiva. First though, we must explain the other version of this myth in the Irish tradition and how it forms a more direct bridge to the Indian version. The Rudra Shiva myth of the churning of the milk sea is about a time when the gods were churning the sea of milk in order to extract the Amrita nectar from it and secure immortality thereby. To do this, they used the snake of Rudra Shiva, Vasuki, wrapped around a mountain and pulled from both sides to churn the sea. The snake, or the sea itself, emitted a terrible poison from the process, and this poison then was threatening to the Asuras and Devas and to the whole world. Rudra Shiva stepped in and swallowed the poison, neutralizing it. His consort, Parvati, quickly grabbed his throat to keep the poison from reaching his stomach. The poison was neutralized, but Shiva's throat turned blue due to contact with the poison. Now we have one very brief but incredibly similar story in the Gaelic corpus. This occurs in the pseudo-historical account of Gaethel Gloss. We shouldn't be confused, however, as multiple cases show that the pseudo-historical figures, like Gaethel Gloss, are commonly the guises of authentic and archaic pagan Celtic myths. See my videos on the creation myth regarding Briochon, Mil Espana, Aver Finn, and others for examples of this. The name Gaethel is a back borrowing from Welsh, and though it was used to mean an Irishman generally, the word means hunter, wild man or woodsman, and is a synonym of the word Fainid, the word for the Fianna war and hunting band members. Of 
Of course, we already know who the hunter god is for the Gaels. He is Fionn, leader of the Fianna. The surname Gavel Bears, Gloss, signifies a certain color, often translated as green or blue. Gavel Gloss gains this name due to the details of his tail. What happens to Gavel in the Book of Invasions is that he is bitten by a snake while in Egypt, and Moses, being nearby, makes a prayer and places his staff on Gavel's wound, curing it. An inserted verse in an earlier passage says of Gavel, quote, green were his arms and his vesture, unquote. Michael O'Clary's redaction of the Book of Invasions adds that the snake bite left a green ring on Gavel, from which he earned his nickname Gloss, meaning the green. Essentially, in these different versions, either the bite or the snake wrapping Gavel around the arms and body leaves his skin turned gloss, a green or blue color, where the poison and the snake had touched. Knowing that Gavel's name directly connects him to Fionn, the hunter and Fenid chief, and knowing that Fionn is directly equivalent to Rudra Shiva, it's impossible not to see how this myth of Gavil is nearly identical to the main event of Shiva's myth as aforementioned. As Shiva drinks the poison of the serpent, has the poison stopped by a nearby helper, and then his skin is left blue where the poison had touched, so likewise Gavil is bitten and wrapped up by a serpent, the poison is stopped by a nearby helper, and his skin is left blue where the poison and snake had touched. Shiva gains a name related to the blue color his skin has required after this very event, Nilakantha, meaning blue throat. Gavil gains a name related to the green-blue color his skin has acquired after this event, Gloss, the green or blue. The only thing difficult about this parallel is the fact that it may be difficult to even believe that the myth has been kept so nearly the same between these cultures so distant in space and time. The exactness of this parallel boggles the mind. Nonetheless, we therefore know, as close to a fact as possible, that the Gaels had traces of this myth within their tradition and that it was connected to their hunter god though preserved under a slightly coded name or epithet, and not under the name Fionn in this particular variant. But Gavel Gloss is found in the pseudo-historical genealogies of the Book of Invasions, and not the Fionn material as usually understood. So perhaps if we looked at the Fionn material proper, the tales of Fionn Makul, it would have a variant of the same tale, a tale we can see the Gales knew well enough and connected to this hunter god type the Rudra god type. That is exactly what I'm proposing we have in the case of the fight of Fionn against Alan. Though some of the details have been changed, it is not difficult to show how this too is a variant of the same myth. Fionn, like Shiva, has to confront an overwhelming noxious force that is threatening to overwhelm the land. In Shiva's confrontation, we have a rare moment where the devas and asuras, the good gods and the anti-gods, are working together to attempt to churn the nectar from the sea. These are rival clans of deities who otherwise are locked in a protracted fight. The exact same, in fact, is the case in Fionn's tale. The feuding clans of Fianna men, clan Bashnia, Finn's clan, and clan Morna, the clan of Gol, are present at the Hall of Tara, and are feasted there in a moment of truce. This is a marked and unusual occasion at the hall. Then there is the noxious threat that no one else can overcome, the halahala poison of the serpent in Shiva's case, and the music and fire of Alan in Finn's. Only Shiva can confront the halahala poison, and only Fionn can confront the music and fire of Alan. They each step forward here when no one else can. Though these noxious threats may seem outwardly different, they are actually similar and produce a similar effect on those present in each case. The music of Alan puts those present to sleep, and the smoke and fire threatens to asphyxiate and burn them. Similarly, the halahala poison of the serpent is emitted as noxious fumes that make those present swoon, 
both the devas and the asuras begin to collapse due to asphyxiation from the poison's fumes, comparable to the men falling asleep from the music of Alan. Thus, they are both airborne threats that incapacitate before killing and destroying fully. The gods fear the poison will consume and destroy the world, as Alan's fire is feared to destroy all of Tara, as it has done so before. So, the music of Alan is like the fumes of Vasuki's poison, while the fire of Alan is equivalent to the destructive power of the poison. Now, centrally to the parallel, this is a myth where Fionn absorbs poison into himself in order to overcome the noxious threat. Most are aware that Fionn presses his spear to his forehead in order to keep himself awake while hearing the music of Alan. What not everyone is aware of is that this is specifically a poison spear with a poison tip, and it is specifically the poison of the spear that Fionn is absorbing into his forehead in order to keep himself awake at this moment, and the text makes this clear. The word used for the power of the spear in question that Fionn absorbs to stay awake is nev, N-E-I-M-H, meaning venom. The translations don't always make this clear, as, for instance, O'Grady's translation of the Colloquy of the Ancients says that what keeps Finn awake is the, quote, noxious missile's horrific effect, unquote, the missile being the spear that he presses to his forehead, thus absorbing this noxious effect. Another place translates the power of the spear as demoniac energy, and elsewhere, dire energy. However, the word translated as noxious here is indeed nev, N-E-I-M-H, which in its literal sense simply means venom or poison, but can be extended to mean deadly, noxious, etc. And thank you to my colleague Bowen Sir for advising on the usage of this word in these various texts. And apologies for my pronunciations. In The Boyhood Deeds of Fionn, a fairy person gives a verse about this very spear of Fionn's and repeatedly uses the word nev to describe it, N-E-I-M-H. In the early modern version of the Colloquy of the Ancients, we have, quote, He took a hold of it, such that the nev, the venom or poison, of the spear did not let him fall asleep, unquote. So, if you assume that the music of Alan that spreads over the land and the fire are simply equivalent to the poison fumes that spread over the land and their threat of destruction, it's the same basic framework. We will see shortly, however, that the poison of the Indian version is also described as fiery, making the parallel much easier to see. Perhaps clinching the core of this parallel, Fionn's defeat of Alan and absorbing the poison of his spear occurs on Samhain, while the churning of the milk sea and Shiva drinking the poison happens at Diwali, which is indeed the Hindu Samhain, occurring at the end of October or beginning of November. This is uncanny indeed. Now, there is more. First, the poison spear of Fionn is here being compared to the serpent of Shiva, Vasuki, which emits the poison though alternately the poison may come from the ocean itself. This is a change in the Gaelic versus the Indian versions, but it is reasonable to say that a serpent that Shiva wears over his neck as a sort of dangerous accessory could be equivalent to the poison spear found in the Gaelic version. It's a slight shift, but still it is the venomous accessory of this particular god, and so the god is actually absorbing the poison of his own venomous accessory in both cases. Second, Alan is also being compared to Vasuki here, so that Vasuki parallels both Fionn's venom spear and Alan at once. The Vasuki role is split between these two in a sense, even though we know the Gales had a version where it, it is just a single snake that attacks Gaethel. However, curiously, it is mentioned in the Colloquy of the Ancients that Fionn's poison spear and Alan himself come from the same she, the same mound. They are said to have the same origin. This is a strong enough detail to suggest that the tale is hinting at an esoteric identity or connection between the spear of Fionn and Alan here. Note also that Vasuki is actually a naga, 
a half man, half serpent. They can take human form. In some Indian texts, the poison fumes he breathes out are indeed fiery, and the fire he breathes specifically blackens the faces of the gods during the milk sea churning episode. Alan, of course, does breathe the fire from his mouth too in his tail. The Mahabharata Astika Parva 28 reads, quote, But with the churning still going on, the poison Kalakuta, aka Halahala, appeared at last. Engulfing the earth, it suddenly blazed up like a fire attended with fumes, and by the scent of the fearful Kalakuta, the three worlds were stupefied, and then Shiva, being solicited by Brahman, swallowed that poison for the safety of the creation. The divine Maheshwara, Shiva, held it in his throat, and it is said that from that time he is called Nila Kantha, blue-throated." The 8th Kanto, 7th chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam describes Vasuki blackening the faces of the devas before Vishnu sends down rain to remedy the situation in that version. Quote, Vasuki had thousands of eyes and mouths. From his mouths he breathed smoke and blazing fire, which affected the demons, headed by Paulama, Kaleya, Bali, and Ilvala. Thus the demons who appeared like Sarala trees burned by a forest fire gradually became powerless. Because the demigods were also affected by the blazing breath of Vasuki, their bodily lusters diminished and their garments, garlands, weapons, and faces were blackened by smoke. However, by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, clouds appeared on the sea, pouring torrents of rain and breezes blew, carrying particles of water from the sea waves to give the demigods relief." Unquote. According to Skanda Purana chapter 9, Quote, verse 107, By that time, the great poison Kalakuta came there. After burning Brahma's world at the outset, it burned Vaikuntha. Vishnu, who dwells in the cavity of the heart of everyone, was burned by the fire of Kalakuta, aka Halahala, also with his attendants. Immediately he acquired the color of Tamala. Vaikuntha also became blue in color. It was surrounded by all the worlds. Hence, all the worlds became encircled by the poisonous substance from the waters." Unquote. Vayu Purana, chapter 54, also describes the same incident. Quote, Janardana Vishnu, who was fair and reddish in complexion, has been burnt by the poison that rises with luster of black fire. He was rendered dark complexion. Unquote. So this is not a one-off, accidental description of the poison it is repeatedly described as having a fiery aspect going along with it. It is interesting then that not only does Fion absorb the poison of his spear, but he then also absorbs the fire of Alan into his cloak, as it says he basically catches the fire in his cloak and carries it into the earth. Quote, Alan began and played his tympan till as his use was, he had lulled everyone else to sleep and then to consume Tara emitted from his mouth his kersh of fire. But to the kersh, Finn opposed the crimson and fringed mantle which he wore, so that instead of speeding horizontally on its mission, they fell down perpendicularly through the air in such a fashion that the fourfold mantle carried the kersh, 26 hands, into the earth." Unquote. And thanks again to Bowen Sir for this amended translation from O'Grady's version. This is a detail worth noting as it echoes the theme of Fion absorbing toward himself the noxious emissions from this confrontation, even though the fire and poison have been split into two aspects here. Even though he absorbs the poison from his spear, he absorbs the emitted fire from his cloak and draws it down safely into the earth, as Shiva also draws the poison down safely into his throat etc., and the spear and the burner are esoterically united in their origin, as aforementioned. Even more, further echoes of shared themes are in the Fion tale if we look closely. It is said in the colloquy that before the battle, a figure named Doireen gives Fion a mead cup that he can't refuse. The colloquy of the ancients text says this mead puts, quote, venom Unquote, in his tongue, which is an odd figure of speech unless it ties into the very parallels we are discussing. Indeed, we once again see the Shiva type 
having poison associated with his mouth after drinking something here. We also see that the Hunt of Schlieve Quillen episode is introduced by Conan asking Fionn, quote, What grade you and your youth, and why is there blemish speckling on your face, and serpent's venom in your tongue, and respect of the dead on your children, and the coldness of bronze in your leather, or how long were you like that, or are you like that still? Unquote. So we find in that episode of the colloquy that Fionn is known to have serpent's venom in his tongue, so it may be more than just a metaphor, as this is a list of real marks and transformations specific to Fionn. Even if it is a figure of speech, it still ties in to the same motif of venom in the mouth of the Shiva type. We also see when looking at the setup to the battle against Alan that other details hint at further parallels with the Shiva myth. The Tara nobles slash incarnated gods of society are all gathered in Tek Myothquarta, M-I-O-D-H-C-H-U-A-R-T-A, meaning House of Mead slash Middle Circuit, House of Mead or Middle Circuit. The early modern colloquy text calls the place where the nobles are gathered when Fionn arrives, which is Tek Myothquarta in the older colloquy, the early modern version calls it the Quirm Taig, C U I R M T H A I G H. And apologies for my pronunciation, but this word means the feast house. This suggests that the name is more likely to be connected to Mead because it's explicitly called the feast house in this other version. So Fionn and the two opposing clans gathering in this central mead house, and Fionn being given a mead that puts poison on his tongue in some sense, may in fact parallel the frame events of the churning of the milk sea, which is all about the extraction of the Amrita nectar from the sea, and its purification from the poison that attends it. The two clans of gods are gathered to drink this Amrita with its special properties, and this Amrita would be an obvious parallel of a sacred mead in the Gaelic tradition. So thus, the mead hall with its mead parallels the milk sea setting with the Amrita that it produces in the Indian version. Alan himself is even very mysteriously connected to mead. His surname, Midjna, M-I-D-H-N-A, is very likely connected to the word for mead. His mother is unnamed in the oldest colloquy text, but in the early modern version, her name is Kuach, C-U-A-C-H, a form of the word Kesh, C-U-A-I-C-H, meaning cup. So, Alan is son of mead and or cup. Meanwhile, the early modern version also says that he mixes hazel mead, specifically, in the cryptic eulogy song sung by Oshin for him. It literally says that Alan mixes hazel mead. Remember that Vasuki, the serpent in question, is the one who literally churns or mixes the ocean of milk to produce the Amrita comparable to the mead in the Indian myth. So both Alan and Vasuki literally mix the sacred liquid producing the mead in some sense. There may be an esoteric pattern below the surface of this story relating to the production of the mead just as we have in the Indian version, though its specifics are now mostly unclear. Finally, in both cases, we have a climactic scene where the defeated enemy's mother appears to dramatically wail for her son or sons. For the Gaelic version, quote, To Alan then his mother came and, after giving way to great grief, went to seek a leech, a doctor, for him. Quote, a lamentable case, O most admirable she-physician, by Fiecha Makongha's spear, by the fatal mantle and by the pointed javelin, Alan Makmijna is slain, Ochone, Alan is fallen, three jets have spurted from him, here is his heart's blood, together with the marrow of his back. Ochone, Alan is fallen, 
very chief of Ben Borka. Now are the numbing death mists come upon him. O Borka, O she physician, tis a lamentable case. O Chon, but he was joyous, and O Chon, but he was blithe, was Alan son of Mijna, of Shlev Fuath. Nine times he burnt up Tara, and to gain high fame was his constant endeavor. Unquote. This was the lament of the mother of Alan after he is slain. This is similar to how Diti, the mother of the Daityas, a.k.a. a tribe of the Asuras, appears and grieves for her children who are killed in the fight over the Amrita that occurs right after the churning and the episode with Shiva. From the Ramayana, Book 1, Balakanda, Sarga 46, we read, quote, O Rama, Lady Diti, was highly anguished for those sons that are killed and said this to her husband, Sage Kashyapa, the son of Sage Marichi. Quote, o God, I am bereaved of my sons who are killed by your great mighty sons, the sons of your second wife, Aditi. Unquote. And then she requests of the gods that she bear a son who will slay Indra in revenge. Following up by saying, quote, such a bereaved mother as I am, I wish to undertake asceticism, and it is apt of you to permit me for penance, and it is also apt of you to accord me pregnancy for an exterminator of Indra, the ruler of worlds. Unquote. Thus Diti spoke to her husband Kashyapa. Unquote. On this point, the mother grieving for the dead enemy who appears right at this particular moment, Alan would roughly hold the place here of the Daityas, or Asuras, generally. So, in summary, in both cases, while the two rival clans of divine beings are met for the purposes of drinking the divine liquid either at a mead hall or a milk sea, an overpowering noxious force emerges, which begins to put to sleep or asphyxiate all present, and threatens total destruction. It has a fiery quality to it in both cases. No one can stop it except for the Rudra Shiva type god, Shiva or Fion. Fion absorbs poison into his forehead at this moment and also absorbs the fire into his cloak to overcome this overwhelming force, while Shiva also drinks the poison at this moment for the same purpose. Fion also drinks a cup that puts venom into his tongue in a poetic sense during this episode. The spear and the burner come from the same she mound, the same origin, connecting them esoterically as two aspects of one force. After the fight that ensues, the mother of the enemy who has been slain comes and grieves for her son or sons. This all happens on Samhain and Diwali, equivalent festivals occurring around the same times in each tradition. So Samhain is, in this sense at least, the Celtic Diwali. Both Samhain and Diwali celebrate other events as well as this one, but on this point the days and their festivals do apparently share an origin. Thus, let's look at Diwali to see how that festival reflects similarities and differences compared to Samhain, to find whether or not much has really changed. Diwali is said to symbolize the spiritual victory of light over darkness, good over evil, and knowledge over ignorance. It is the commemoration of the churning of the milk sea to gain the Amrita, Shiva drinking the poison, and particularly of the birth of Lakshmi, goddess of fortune, prosperity, and wealth, who is also born from the churning of the milk sea. For the Gaels, this is the day when Fion overcame Alan and saved Tara. It is the day when Fion made a truce with Gol and the clan of Morna, and united their forces, becoming the high Fiona chief over them all, by a momentous handshake between Gol and himself. From that time forward, the Fiona were in their fullest force. Please see my other videos on Fion for related topics. Happy Samhain, Diwali, and Halloween to everyone. Please check out my Patreon if you would like to support the channel and see all of the important topics I have in mind get made into videos, as well as supporting the completion of my second book, Briochan's Tower in which many mysteries will be solved. My book, Taliesin's Map, is available from Amazon. Link in the description. Make sure to like and subscribe for more, as we map the myths.